Good this morning. conference will now be recorded. We will. We hope to have a, a good day and a good start of the day. Uh, this is the conference organized by the University of Tirana and the, the CIDEV. Uh, we are in the framework of a Jean Monnet module, and we are very happy to have here a very good panelists and good uh, experts in the issues of European, U European integration and Western Balkans. The title of the conference is the European integration of the Western Balkans resilience failures and challenges. But before, uh, before explaining all the issues we are going to talk about uh, today, I'll leave the floor to the Vice Rector of the University of Tirana, who will be welcoming this conference. The floor to you, Gentiana. Um. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to uh, be part of uh, this conference opening session uh, uh, today. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, Your Excellency Ambassador of the Delegation of the European Union to Albania, Mr. Luigi Soreka, dear colleagues and participants of the conference. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Rector to this virtual uh, conference, which is, uh, as already mentioned, organized in the framework of a Jean, model, uh, Jean Monnet module uh, at the University of Tirana. And the conference is organized in cooperation with the Center uh, for Science and Innovation for Development. The conference addresses uh, the integration of the uh, Western Balkans in the European Union, which is a very important process for Albania and for, um, for the region. And we all know that Albania has actually the highest percentage of um, people who uh, actually are in favor of this uh, of this process which is uh, which is good and uh, what i find especially important um, uh, that the organizers addressed are the implications um, which were caused by uh, covid 19 pandemics which um, has we must admit holds important challenges uh, to states and societies and we have been experiencing some very unusual times uh, uh, recently. Um, of course, these last few months have been challenging also for universities because we had to adjust to new working conditions and especially considering the fact that universities are places of exchange of people's ideas, research, it has not been uh, always easy to manage uh, the situation. Uh, which is why I appreciate uh, very much the initiative that the organizers uh, took for bringing together in this conference academics, policymakers, and representatives of civil society and putting together such an engaging conference program. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tadiana Bishku and all the collaborators uh, for their work in organizing uh, this virtual conference. I hope you will enjoy these two days of uh, debate and uh, networking. And I thank you all for the participation and wish you all a very successful conference. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kira, for this warm welcome. And who could better represent the European Union and its program, Erasmus Plus program, uh, than, than Mr. Ambassador Luigi Soreca in this case. Um, thank you, Ambassador, for accepting our invitation and we are looking forward to hear to your remarks. Uh, good morning, uh, Claudiana. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Good, good morning to you all. It's my pleasure to uh, see you and uh, hopefully meet you as well uh, as soon as possible but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, on behalf of the European Union delegation I want to uh, wish you a, a, a great two days conference on a subject which uh, couldn't be more appropriate. Uh, if I could start from the end uh, uh, of my uh, presentation, I would like to add a, a word to the title of your uh, conference. 
after resilience, failure, and challenges, I will ask also to ask to add the word success. Because uh, COVID-19 uh, has not affected the EU integration of the Western Balkans. And this is uh, 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 clearly uh, showed by uh, the way during the crisis uh, the European Union uh, and its member states and uh, the, the, the country and the region has shown mutual proximity and solidarity. Uh, after a moment in which inevitably the member states taken by uh, the outbreak of COVID have looked at their own internal health situation, I think the European Union has reacted very promptly vis-a-vis -vis the Western Balkans. Uh, and in two phases, uh, an important uh, financial, uh, I would say also political assistance has been allocated for the Western Balkans. On the 29th of April, uh, or as you might remember, the EU has uh, mobilized 3.3 uh, uh, billion euro to the benefit of the Western Balkans in order to tackling, first of all, the uh, immediate health sector needs, but uh, even more importantly, to prepare the aftermath uh, of the end of the crisis, uh, in order to look at uh, support for the social economic recovery that uh, will have to be handled in the next weeks and months. Um, we also see how uh, the European Union has put at disposal of the Western Balkans all its uh, cooperation tool. We have launched, uh, we have allowed the Western Balkans to be part of the joint procurement process that has allowed to procure uh, protective equipment in a faster way. We have also restricted the export of protective personal equipment for the Western Balkan countries, despite the fact that uh, uh, this was not happening for the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, the member states were inevitably looking at their own situation, therefore opening the market uh, of the European Union towards the Western Balkan has been a, a, another sign of solidarity or the fast flow of essential goods through the green lane uh, linking the EU and the Western Balkans, and of course the donation uh, of uh, uh, testing material uh, and uh, 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 other uh, protective equipment. Only here in Albania, the EU delegation is uh, going to manage 230 million euro, uh, four of which have already been invested, uh, on uh, on health uh, uh, sector needs. On Monday, I will deliver to the Ministry of uh, Health five ambulances, uh, several ventilators, and more than 100 hospital beds, which is the second installment of our, our support. Uh, but uh, I would like also to remember that this solidarity in Albania goes back to November last year when uh, the state of emergency uh, started with uh, the uh, dramatic earthquake that uh, hit Albania with uh, 51 casualties. And also in that context, the EU was very uh, uh, immediately showing solidarity. And you all remember, I'm sure, the extremely successful uh, donor conference of the 17th of February that brought to Albania 1.1 billion euro of donation and very favorable loans that now have been already implemented through the EU for School uh, program that uh, already is taking care to rebuild many schools in Albania. Uh, this too tells that during the crisis, uh, the solidarity has not stopped. 
and uh, paradoxically uh, in the mid of this crisis the historical day of 25th of march that uh, has brought to the opening of uh, decision to open accession negotiation uh, uh, has been uh, has intervened uh, i remember when uh, eight months ago after the non-decision by the european council to open accession negotiation uh, uh, there were very negative uh, headlines, uh, not only in Albania, but in the region, talking about the loss of leverage by the EU in the Balkans, the, dead, the, the end of the enlargement progress uh, and, and process. And I said at the time at the National Council for European Integration that not everything was negative in that moment. This has indeed launched uh, uh, such a rich debate in the, in the region about integration that then has brought uh, to the adoption of the new methodology and the progress made in the country, uh, including the one in which I am, that brought to the decision of the 25th uh, of, uh, of March. And uh, if I can uh, mention my president, the President von der Leyen, uh, I think uh, uh, she has made in, in very few uh, weeks or months regular statements uh, on, in, in favor of the Western Balkans and showing how the EU is committed to deliver uh, uh, despite the crisis. Uh, I mentioned the new methodology, uh, but also I would like to mention the Youth Zagreb Summit that was a very important milestone in our view to endorse the methodology and task the Commission to propose a broad economic investment plan for the region. Uh, this will come in October, but already now, for example, Albania has been granted 180 million uh, uh, very favorable loans from the European Commission for Social Economic Recovery. I think uh, uh, once again, in this very difficult moment, uh, the EU integration process has shown with the new commission, with the new commitment, with the new methodology, and therefore the new engagement by the member states that uh, 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 the crisis has not stopped integration. Uh, and I want to uh, use uh, exactly the title of our panel. Uh, talking about the implication of the aftermath of the crisis, as you say in the title of our panel, what's next? Uh, certainly, uh, the financial assistance will help to overcome the crisis, which is going to be important in the region and also in Albania. Uh, there's been a loss of... Uh, employment, there will be uh, uh, a, a GDP uh, 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 lowering of, of important amount in the next months. Uh, the forecast for next year is more positive, but uh, uh, talking about integration, I think we are living a very important moment. Uh, Albania, for example, has to go through uh, a, a, a very important uh, reform process uh, the council conclusion of the 25th of march are a roadmap uh, to follow i think uh, uh, what is very important is to find back a strong party consensus in the country uh, to make sure that cooperation and i would say also compromise becomes the buzzword of the next uh, uh, months of work in Albania. Uh, last week we had a positive step forward with the political agreement on the electoral reform, which shows that uh, when it comes to EU integration and the conditions to be fulfilled in order to move forward, uh, the, uh, the pressure coming from the 97% of Albanian that wants to join the union brings party as stakeholders together. 
And only two days ago, we had a very important uh, meeting of the National Council of European Integration, uh, where the, all the institutions uh, involved in, the, in this process, but also the judicial institution, the independent institution, the civil society, the member states representative, uh, they all looked at uh, the action plan that the government has put on the table to try to uh, coordinate the action of the whole society effort which is necessary to move forward. So uh, we are uh, in a crisis. I think the crisis uh, is not over as the last uh, figures unfortunately show not only in Albania but also in the neighbor country. But uh, uh, the crisis has found the Western Balkans and the European Union close. I would say also in a two ways uh, direction, uh, with, uh, for example, Albania helping uh, uh, some of the closest member states uh, to go through uh, the difficult crisis. So uh, if, I, if I have to say, as I told you, I would like to add also the word success at the end of the title of today's uh, conference. Uh, because uh, uh, we can see that in the last six months, uh, the the concept and the debate on EU integration has have moved forward, going through the crisis, uh, ready hopefully through a, a, a new uh, a spirit of consensus and compromise in the country, uh, uh, moving towards the opening of negotiation as soon as possible in the next IGC. So. I was very pleased to uh, uh, be uh, asked to give some remarks. Uh, I'm looking forward to listen to uh, my friend uh, Dietmir Bouchati uh, uh, and how he sees this situation, but also I will be following uh, the whole panel uh, to listen to very interesting uh, uh, panelists that I see and I follow also uh, uh, constantly. So, once again, thank you to the university. Uh, Claudiana, thank you for having me. And uh, uh, once again, Erasmus program, the European Union delegation is always ready to support this kind of event. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. It was such a pleasure to, 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 to bring, to, to hear the, the European Union's perspective. Uh, through your through, through your remarks, uh, the, the, one of the of the strongest point of this conference was uh, the fact or the aim to bring together different perspectives. So if you if you you will have time, as you said, to follow all the panel, uh, you will uh, also listen to the to, to to the perspective of the of the Western Balkans. And another aim, another objective of, of this conference was to bring together policymakers and academics. So with the invitation of Mr. Bouchade, former Minister for Foreign Affairs in Albania, actually uh, engaged in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and also a deputy of the Parliament, of the Albanian Parliament, I think we have uh, reached this objective. So uh, we are, the floor is yours, Mr. Bouchade. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Claude, for inviting me to this uh, panel. Uh, and thank you also to uh, all panelists that are uh, with us today virtually um, to discuss some of the um, uh, recent topics which uh, I suppose are of uh, uh, mutual interest. Uh, I uh, I will try to stick to the time and also to the uh, topic that has been uh, proposed by you about the EU and the Western Balkans after COVID-19. Although, as uh, Ambassador uh, Soreka rightly pointed out, the recent figures are showing that we are not yet at the post-COVID uh, situation. Uh, but if uh, I have to analyze the uh, current situation within, uh, first within European Union and then Western Balkans, and also the interaction between EU and Western Balkans, it's without saying that 
the water under the bridge is not going to be the same after uh, this situation. And we all have to align the reality with uh, our minds. Um, uh, having seen the debate and the clash between uh, US and, and, and China uh, recently, uh, EU looks uh, a bit squeezed between this uh, rivalry uh, and it's positioning itself um, as a global as a global uh, power and this is one of the reason why the defining words of the eu agenda of intent are above all sovereignty and strategic autonomy uh, i agree with uh, ambassador soreka the reaction of uh, european union vis-a-vis -vis western balkans was a prompt one uh, there have been few excesses uh, in the Western Balkans, blaming uh, blaming European Union, but I believe uh, this uh, did not prove uh, did not prove true. However, uh, we need to uh, also evidence the fact that uh, the cooperation between uh, Western Balkans and European Union has been very good also in the past crisis. Um, and in the past crisis, we've seen European Union uh, having a common sense and a common understanding uh, with countries in the Western Balkans, more than uh, countries with its own family, in responding, for instance, to the refugee crisis in 2015. Uh, here, I would like to point out the case of North Macedonia and, and Serbia at the time, but also Albania and Montenegro that responded positively and in a very uh, courageous uh, manner um, towards the challenges of, of, of the time, which was not the case with a few other uh, EU member states. What we see as a positive development is also the change of attitude uh, in the German-French relationship. In the past years, um, they were seen as a pushbackers. Now, um, with the recovery, with the recovery agenda, and the, with the recovery plan that has been presented by both Chancellor Merkel and President Macron, whether it is a Hamiltonian moment for European Union or not, this remains to be seen. But it is uh, uh, for sure that uh, uh, there is a plan ahead for European Union how to emerge uh, uh, stronger after after COVID. Then we have seen also um, certain initiatives towards uh, Western Balkan countries, which uh, I hope will be complemented in the near future. First, it's uh, the question of uh, the new methodology. Although I have always believed that uh, the enlarging process is not lacking uh, methodology and instruments, uh, the, the, we have seen also, and we have adapted an enlargement strategy also uh, in Sofia summit back in 2018. And sometimes I get the impression that uh, more paperwork we do, uh, less substantive uh, we, we, we sound. Uh, then there has been the uh, Zagreb summit as a milestone of uh, EU engagement towards Western Balkans. But as someone who have uh, been engaged into this process since the early days, if I compare the topics of the Zagreb Summit 2020 with the topics of uh, Zagreb Summit uh, in 2000, so 20 years, uh, they are more or less the same. The menu of discussion with Western Balkans is more or less the same. It's all about rule of law. And in 20 years' time, with the exception of Croatia, all other uh, countries that are part of stabilization and association process are still are still uh, in, 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 in the process of uh, joining, joining, European, joining European Union. Then we have had uh, the decision of uh, uh, European Union to start the um, accession negotiations with uh, North Macedonia, um, which was a clear green light, and also a decision to start accession negotiations with Albania based on a catalogue of standards or reforms. I don't want to engage into the uh, internal political bitterness in Albania because there are enough politicians in the country that are counting whether there are 15 or 20 or 4 or 25 uh, uh, standards or benchmarks to be met. But I would prefer 
to speak about the catalog of, uh, of, of, of standards or homework that we have, to, uh, that we have to, to address or to meet in order to start the uh, accession process. Uh, we have been expecting also the publication of the annual reports, uh, but they have been again <laughs> uh, postponed for, 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 for the fall time. I hope uh, this will help uh, uh, chances of President Vucic to cement further uh, his authority uh, in Serbia, and I hope also our friends uh, in North Macedonia will be will be uh, will be boosted. Although there is uh, there is uh, a season of uh, elections in the Balkans coming up also in uh, um, in in in, uh, in Montenegro and next year in Albania, and I I would not rule out also early elections in. Um, in Kosovo. Um, last thing about European Union and and uh, and the transatlantic uh, rift we have experienced uh, during this period of time, especially in Kosovo. I remember I was in office when uh, Prespa agreement was uh, was uh, has been negotiating between uh, Greece and North Macedonia, and there has been a spirit of unity between US on one hand and key EU member states, especially those that form part of twin countries that are part of European Union plus, uh, plus UK. Um, now we see that in the so-called Brussels dialogue, uh, the appointment of, uh, of, of Lychak uh, and the way how EU is trying to position uh, itself on one hand, and uh, on the other hand, the, the, the involvement of uh, special envoy of President Trump, uh, Ambassador Grenell, um, you get the idea that there is not that much synergy uh, going on uh, in this respect. It is true that this is uh, a European issue. Uh, Kosovo and Serbia are geographically part of the uh, European Union. But, you know, uh, our generation is used to see uh, United States of America, as, as Richard Bro uh, Holbrook once used to say, as a European power, not as another power in Europe. And now, uh, again, we have to align our mind with the new reality. This is not uh, anymore the case. And this is going to be a test uh, for the success of um, uh, European Union in its own courtyard, especially given the fact that uh, uh, that uh, President von der Leyen has uh, spelled out the idea of having a geopolitical, a geopolitical uh, commission. Uh, uh, three very uh, pressing issues will continue to be there for uh, Western Balkans, and uh, some of these issues are all are also connected with the decision making of governments in the region. Uh, during uh, during the pandemic, first is the question of uh, democracy and uh, rule of law, and uh, um, I must admit, uh, having read the French paper, uh, apart from very good ideas that it has been outlined in the document, uh, th this non-paper uh, was quite absent. Uh, terms state capture, corruption, rule of law were quite absent in the in the in the in the in the non-paper presented by uh, presented by France, then we have seen the document being adopted uh, um, in uh, in uh, um, in Zagreb a few weeks ago. Uh, there are very few words about uh, rule of law, about uh, uh, state capture, uh, about uh, corruption, about unelected uh, about elected leaders versus unelected oligarchs. Uh, and then we have we have seen also uh, a little uh, engagement from European Commission when it comes to the preparation of uh, um, of, uh, of of these documents, uh, and it, you get the impression that there is a disconnection between the methodology that it, uh, that has been presented, where rule of law uh, comes first, with the document being being adopted uh, in, uh, in 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 Zagreb. I know, and the ambassador just mentioned that uh, uh, there might be an effort to present uh, a more comprehensive uh, strategy and approach together with uh, uh, with the annual uh, reports uh, during the the the, the uh, autumn. Uh, 
uh, but again, uh, I believe uh, the need for a better connection between rule of law and economic development uh, um, uh, should be reflected in all documents and in all actions uh, uh, provided by, uh, by European Commission. The second challenge is about uh, democracy, uh, about uh, uh, we, we, we are lacking role models uh, in, our, in, our, in our societies. In the 90s, it was, it was easier. Uh, there were role models, there were agents of change. Now, uh, now people have uh, the fate of people uh, is not anymore is not anymore is not anymore as it used to be. Um, people are trying to find shortcuts to go to to European Union, and um, uh, therefore agents of uh, agents of of, of change uh, are, are 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 missing. And this is being coupled with uh, a lack of ownership in the reform process. So if uh, Visegrad countries uh, have been frustrated by the process of imitation of standards with EU acquis and imitation of uh, lifestyle, what we see in the Balkans and particularly in, in Albania, we see a lack of ownership for the reform process. So uh, we see political actors accusing, uh, accusing uh, our partners for the failures uh, in the reform process, namely elements related to uh, justice reform. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we say also that sometimes this is, uh, this is a reform where we have a co-ownership with international partners, but this is just hiding behind uh, the, the truth. And the truth is, in my, in, my, in my humble opinion, that we haven't demonstrated uh, an ownership to, these, uh, to this process. And this is also the reason why uh, the, 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 the blame game is, 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 is going on. And the, third, uh, and the third element is the economic development. Uh, if um, the European perspective is not becoming clear, if European perspective uh, is not uh, becoming uh, tangible uh, for, for, for citizens, not only in Albania, but also in um, other Western Balkan countries, uh, I'm afraid we might uh, see a transformation of enlargement policy into a containment policy. And uh, I'm afraid uh, we uh, will continue to live in a transitocracy um, uh, where uh, we uh, have to address all sorts of, uh, of trauma in our own A. And uh, at the same time, we have to speak also about uh, uh, the influence and the penetration of the so-called uh, uh, third actors that have been also quite active uh, during this period of time. So if China, for instance, in the past was uh, exerting debt diplomacy uh, in our region, and uh, in a more in a more uh, vibrant way in Serbia and in in Montenegro, we have seen during the COVID period a mass diplomacy being asserted by 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 China. If we are used to see uh, Turkey uh, playing an active role within the boundaries of uh, Muslim fraternity. Uh, we have seen Turkey before uh, COVID and also after COVID going beyond uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim fraternity uh, boundaries in the region. Uh, these are, uh, not to mention here also the, the, the role of, uh, of, of Russia, which we all know in, in, the, in, the, in, in the region, and also the position of uh, uh, GCC countries vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis other actors in the region, having in mind the fact that Balkan is always considered as a pivot for, for, for Europe. So all these elements should be taken uh, into consideration when we speak about the geopolitical battle of the European Union that, in my humble view, should be won first and, for and foremost in the backyard of, of Europe, which is Western Balkan. Thank you, and I will be part of the panel until uh, the very last. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bouchat. It's always a pleasure to listen to your insightful thoughts and ideas, especially in, in uh, this reality of the Western Balkans and Albania, which is not easy, if we might 
say so. Uh, it's, um, yeah, you, 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 thank you for, ex for exposing all the features and all the elements of this reality. Uh, and uh, we, we all agree, I think, that pandemic is not the only reason that uh, will, uh, or the only cause that will uh, reform or will shape the, the future of the Western Balkans in the, in the Europe. Uh, I will uh, I'll give the, the, the floor to Professor Florian Bieber who will further explore these both sides of and perspectives. Thank you, Professor. Well, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to at least virtually travel to Tirana today. Um, it's uh, nice in these times to at least think one could be somewhere else uh, for at least a few hours. Um, I'm very much appreciative of the comments of uh, Dietmir, who I think very much outlined many things I was also uh, going to outline the kind of contradictions we're finding ourselves in. Let me structure my brief observations to build on the previous uh, notices on, on a couple of points. What is the implications of COVID, um, ongoing COVID, um, the perception gap, um, the EU both moving and not moving, and the challenges, I think, coming up. So, of course, I think we all know that uh, COVID uh, pandemic will be with us, not just for a few more weeks, but probably for um, at least half a year to a bit longer. So, um, and uh, this is something which uh, will shape, uh, will, the, the kind of trajectory of this will is not over. Um, I think we can say so far that, of course, the Western Balkans have been relatively lucky in the global or at least European scale in many ways and I think it's important to keep that in mind um, uh, in terms of the health um, impact but um, I think there are other things of course which will only become visible down the road and I think the economic impercussions will be quite dramatic um, talking to colleagues even if there is some kind of recovery next year I think the setback is quite dramatic especially there will be probably long-term consequences as um, the economies of the Western Balkans are so much dependent on the economic well-being of the European Union and especially countries like Albania will rely very much on remittances and the uh, uh, migration, many uh, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people across the Western Balkans who returned uh, from the European Union in March in particular uh, means that there are lots of economic ties which are disrupted, um, which I think will take a long time to rebuild because in the European Union itself there's going to be an economic crisis felt for quite some time, not to mention tourism and so on. So I think we, we have no clear sense of the, of the scale of the, of the economic impact of it. Um, the, the second point I want to come want to, want to point out to is the perception uh, issue. So I think to come back, I mean, COVID and the pandemic is not, it didn't change anything. It just made certain trends accelerated or visible. Um, so the Western Balkans and Europe don't look different now than they did before, um, but they look at a certain, with certain trends, certain, certain uh, tendencies have become more accentuated and more strengthened and reinforced. So, um, well, uh, as the uh, ambassador has noted, there's been substantial EU assistance um, for the Western Balkans. The perception is not always the case. Um, and again, this is not the fault of the European Union, um, but also of governments in the region, I would say not so much in Albania, but in other countries, in particular in Serbia, that uh, the biggest assistance is often thought to be China or uh, other countries. And this perception is very hard to eradicate, especially as it was formed during a moment of crisis. Um, and we know that this imprints itself very strongly in people's memories, even though evidence uh, has been clearly demonstrated to the opposite. And governments, some governments in the region have been keeping up this myth, or when they corrected this, they've only done so, they've only done so to non-widely consumed media. So I think there is a problem that in the region, the European Union is um, perceived to be less, in a certain way, solidaric than it, than it actually was. Um, and this is something which we have to take very seriously. We also have you know, a, a large scale of misinformation, both conspiracy theories and deliberate misinformation across Europe and across the region, all of which I think skews people's perception. And I think the... Um, what we also see in several countries of the region 
very erratic behavior to the pandemic. So very long lockdowns, um, you know, 80 hours people couldn't leave their house. Now I read that in Belgrade there was a football game with 25,000 people just uh, the other day. Um, so from you know locking people in to completely um, having you know big, biggest possible events within a few weeks creates confusion, and I think lots of citizens in the region are deeply unsure and have left in a certain way in a in a sense of um, in a sense of who to trust, who are the authorities to trust, and I think this in a certain way goes back to something which Jitmi was saying, you know, the kind of classical model models of what to follow are no longer uh, that much there, um, both when it comes to democracy, but also maybe you don't trust your own government anymore because you don't know what exactly is the right way to do, but then what is the right model? And, you know, of course, all across Europe, we've had a moment of uncertainty and, um, and unclarity. So I think this kind of lack of orient uh, somebody could just turn off their microphone. Thank you. Um, the, the lack of clarity and orientation is something which we'll have to regain. And uh, this has been, of course, happening before COVID that in a certain way, the narrative of EU integration and liberal democracy as a part and parcel of the obvious trajectory has become in a certain way much more confused. Um, and it's not confused because I think it is it is, of course, the best uh, model for societies I it's, uh, in the Western Balkans, but it has been challenged and it has been blurred. Um, and it's not blurred because there's a clear alternative, but it's been blurred rather by throwing doubts, questions, talking about other actors, none of which really offer anything beyond some financial investments, but no kind of pathway to a sustainable open society, uh, which is also prosperous. But I think we have to take this seriously and not just say this is something which is just um, a passing phase, and I think COVID has made these more uh, more uh, more visible. Now, when it comes to the European Union, I mean, I agree with the, with the ambassador that uh, the European Union has been very uh, has been good at moving the process forward uh, despite the pandemic. So the decision to uh, to uh, overcome the blockage uh, in March uh, in regard to Albania and North Macedonia was a very important step. And I think we all were very happy after the frustration many of us have felt uh, in the fall uh, over the veto by some EU member states on this matter. Um, so this is certainly encouraging, including also the the um, the um, uh, the financial assistance for the region. But I think what is even more important is the internal movement in the European Union in the last couple of months. First of all, uh, there is, of course, a problem that um, in countries which have been various, very, um, very positive about the European Union in the past, there's been a, a rise of Euroscepticism. Uh, notably Italy, um, which uh, is of course also a close partner of Albania, uh, has in the past always been quite pro-European, pro pro-EU, but um, the perception, and again I'm talking about perception, the perception that other EU member states were not showing sufficient solidarity during the pandemic has dampened um, the enthusiasm. And, this, and this, uh, these are uh, these are perceptions become realities if they set in. So this is something we have to take very seriously. Um, now, there was, uh, what is interesting is that a criticism of the European Union during the pandemic was not the classic criticism of the European Union. The European Union is usually criticized by skeptics in the EU for overreaching, for doing too much, for uh, trying to be too dominant. The main criticism of the EU during the pandemic was that it didn't do enough. Right. This is in a certain way the kind of paradox that um, uh, all of a sudden Eurosceptics who for years said the EU shouldn't do this, the EU shouldn't intervene there, the EU shouldn't become a super state, the EU shouldn't um, gain more powers. All of a sudden, why doesn't the EU do that? Why is the EU helping? Why is the EU doing all of that? So in a certain way, they were criticizing the EU for that, what they've been asking the EU not to be for many years. So, of course, it's in a certain way kind of... Um, it's kind of a, a paradox, but I think it is also it is encouraging because it does open the door to actually change the European Union, and um, uh, and we've seen I think more signs in recent weeks that the that key countries in the EU are willing to cons consider changing the way the EU operates um, more so than in the last decade, um, and this is encouraging because. This has been a big taboo since the beginning of the crisis in the economic crisis and after the Lisbon Treaty, not touch the treaties, keep the EU as it is. It's too difficult to, to deal with any changes. Now we are having a conversation. It's just beginning, but we're having a conversation. And why is this important? 
because until uh, until the EU addresses the rule of law issues within the European Union, I think enlargement is not going to happen. Um, now, I'm not necessarily a fan of uh, Emmanuel Macron's policies towards enlargement, but he does have a very important point, and that point is that the EU has no mechanisms to deal with rule of law uh, problems inside the Union, and we have uh, a persistent and worsening problem in Hungary, um, in Poland, and we are at the moment also moving in Slovenia in a direction which very much looks like a Hungarian scenario, where the Prime Minister was regularly attacking the media, public broadcasters, political critics, and using the, using the rhetoric of Viktor Orban. So, why would any member state who is in favor of the rule of law and against authoritarian tendencies be willing to accept countries into the European Union where there might be more Orbans or Orban, uh, Orban-like governments which undermine the rule of law and the independent institutions? So this discussion in the EU about changing is the opportunity actually to take care of the issues which preclude, I would say, current enlargement. Because I have always argued, and others, um, also we at the Balkans and Europe Policy Advisory Group have argued that, of course, uh, enlargement and changing the EU have to can exist and can happen at the same time. We all know that enlargement will not uh, be completed in the next five years. So um, one can have those as parallel tracks, but it now seems an opportunity to actually engage with this issue. I know it's going to be difficult because as long as we have several member states who are uh, 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 flouting the rule of law, it's going to be hard to change the constitution, uh, the, 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 the treaties and, and to have effective mechanisms. But at least we're seeing some movement of opening, being willing to to open in a certain way the European Union structures. Now, let me uh, conclude on, on the note about, about where I think I see enlargement standing. And there I'm a lot, lot less uh, optimistic at the end of the day. While the, the train is moving, uh, I'm not sure it's really moving uh, effectively. So um, the two countries which have been negotiating for many years now about EU enlargement um, uh, accession, uh, Serbia and Montenegro, are in terms of democracy and rule of law no closer to the standards of the European Union today than they were five years ago. In fact, they're further away. The, the elections which are going to take place in June in Serbia are probably one of the least democratic elections we've seen in, a, in two decades in Serbia. The media space is completely dominated by the ruling party. The ruling party is likely to gain well above 50 percent in a process which is far from free, free and fair. And all of this is happening at the moment as the country is supposedly uh, in EU accession talks. But also, you know, we have similar trends in other countries. And I mean, I have to say, I, I did note with, with great concern what was happening also in Albania when it came to the demolition of the, uh, of the National Theatre, which I thought was, you know, in a country which aspires to join the European Union to destroy a building, again, without the merits of the specific case, but like uh, with bulldozers at four o'clock or five o'clock at night uh, on a weekend, strikes me as very strange. It's a very strange way to show your commitment to rule of law and inclusive. And so again, these are these are just snapshots, but we know they occur in many ways across the region, and this is despite EU accession. And so I think this is, you know, just getting EU accession moving without rule of law and democracy becoming better is a meaningless process. Um, and I haven't seen yet the willingness to really tackle this beyond, uh, you know, the formalistic uh, approach. Uh, the EU and its member states have often been silent on some of these abuses or very quiet. Um, and I'm not yet sure that the new methodology really offers, uh, they offer some new tools, but are they going to be used? There has been the imbalance clause for many years, which allow for uh, accession talks to be basically stopped if there's a great discrepancy between rule of law and other chapters. They have not been used for Serbia. They have not been used for Montenegro. This tool has been around since 2012, 2013. So the problem is not that we need new, I don't Think we need new strategies. We don't need, you know, all kinds of new toolboxes. We're not even using the ones which exist. Um, and so, from this point of view, I'm not convinced that uh, without a will to really tackle uh, authoritarian tendencies and rule of law problems in all of the countries of the Western Balkans, much more upfront, much more directly, that the current process is going anywhere. Um, and this is really my, my great concern I have at the moment. Um, and um, so while I'm optimistic that there might be some movement in the European Union to tackle rule of law within the European Union, I think the EU has to 
show and demonstrate that it takes it seriously in its communication to the governments and to the citizens as well, that this is not something which is just going to be swept under the carpet because one wants to continue the process. And I think this is what concerns me is that I'm sympathetic to keep the process of enlargement going, but if the price is that what ignores rule of law problems, then I think uh, we're in, in difficult terrain. So I think there we all need to have in a certain way, use the tools available more, need clearer, more vocal um, uh, uh, formulation of the problems. And uh, unless we see that, I'm not, I'm not really sure that we're going to see um, substantial movement in the coming years when it comes to accession beyond a kind of formalistic process. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bieber. Yes, it's true. There are a lot of contradictions in both sides, in the EU and the Western Balkans. And you, you really mentioned the most, uh, the most important ones. Uh, we have, uh, we have to be prepared to, to, to listen to even more critics during this, this panel and the next one, uh, at both directions. So. Uh, Please, I, I just want to remember to uh, everybody who wants to pose questions, to use the chat box here and to, to start with posing questions. We will have a few minutes afterwards to, to, to take some questions. And uh, there is a very interesting question that, that um, Professor Abazi poses. She says, is it great expect expectations or the end of the illusions for the Western Balkans after the COVID-19 pandemic situation? The floor is yours, Mr. Mrs. Abazi. Uh, okay. Uh, good uh, morning or good um, good day to everybody. It's uh, such a pleasure to be in a in a panel discussing about uh, so many important issues about the Western, uh, Western Balkans, but also uh, the uh, critical period we are uh, crossing with the pandemic that. Uh, uh, not only surprised everybody, but also uh, produced a great uh, crisis, which led anybody uh, thinking that this could be a turning point in uh, in history. And uh, we will be living after a world a fundamentally different uh, different uh, period. In Europe, even some predicted that uh, uh, this uh, pandemic will mark the end of the European Union, the surcharge of nationalism the undermining of uh, free movements and, of, uh, and trade, and the return of uh, vigorously of the national sovereignty. Yet, um, on March 25th, as everybody knows, the Council of the European Union uh, chose, chose to show up uh, with an uh, enlargement move, uh, giving the great li green light to the opening of access of negotiation to Albania and Northern Man Monte uh, Montenegro after several periods of uh, after periods of refusal for both countries. Uh, the geopolitical breeze blew this time in, for, in favor of those who wanted to the opening of the negotiation with Albania and uh, Mas uh, Northern Macedonia. Uh, so the novel coronavirus, uh, coronavirus has turned into a hurricane and the flexibility was uh, uh, the world that uh, preferred euph euphemism for a uh, concerted effort to water down the previous uh, cautiousness attitudes. However, the job strategic importance of the region in combination with uh, the need uh, to support pro-European leaders in the region has, uh, however, uh, weakened the strength of uh, political conditionality, uh, which is uh, the means that the European Union uh, 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 vigorously used in order to make uh, uh, the membership of uh, a candidate countries possible. And even some would say that uh, uh, this uh, uh, this move has the a big contribution productive in the establishment of uh, 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 democracy as state capture is growing in the uh, Western Balkans. Uh, democratization of, welcome of Western Balkans is one of the biggest projects of the European Union and uh, the, the failure of this uh, project will be a big challenge for the Union. Uh, of course, um, trying to be a little bit different from the previous uh, previous. Uh, uh, speakers, I would like uh, to mention that uh, 
although we are uh, coming up with new strategies uh, and uh, uh, trying to uh, diversify uh, uh, the procedures that each country has to follow in order to join the European Union, there is not a reflection about uh, the working of condi conditionality. And if there is a kind of a problem of applying this conditionality in the way it is proposed for the European, uh, for the Western Balkan countries, and according to recent studies, uh, the, the way the po political conditionality is uh, is uh, presented uh, has uh, is problematic for the Western Balkan countries, and it explained the state uh, capture because it was applied in uh, uh, the liberalization of the markets uh, uh, was applied in the absence of a comprehensive legal framework and the existence of competitive uh, markets in, uh, in the uh, region, alone a small uh, economic uh, elite to realize private gains and build a powerful network that influences uh, political uh, decision making. Also, um, the idea, uh, the idea, um, the, the the move that the European Union has followed has been uh, the uh, the one of. Uh, uh, top-down, uh, which uh, has weakened international mechanism of uh, accountability, allowing ruling elites to uh, uh, silence down opponents. And uh, uh, the meeting, the, the progress of the European uh, Union uh, membership, which by many leaders in the regions uh, and uh, all political parties is uh, considered as uh, uh, a mean uh, to uh, consolidate and legitimize uh, uh, the domestic uh, power. Um, the fre frequent uh, interaction of those uh, leaders with uh, high-ranking uh, European Union uh, officials has served as a, as a kind of legitimizing, uh, uh, legitimizing uh, process of uh, this uh, of this uh, ruling uh, elite, uh, even uh, uh, some of the, the uh, some of the uh, leading politicians have found their glory uh, in this uh, kind of interaction with high European uh, uh, high European uh, officials. Uh, so as a result, uh, the countries of the uh, Western Balkan seems uh, uh, now under uh, under a state cu uh, culture trap that lead, uh, lead to the stagnation of uh, democracy and the uh, inability to implement uh, uh, deeper deep uh, reforms. Uh, <clears throat> to go on, I uh, just um, although. Uh, we can say that uh, the decision for the opening of negotiation with the countries such as Albania and Northern Macedonia has uh, been long awaited. Uh, um, uh, and in fact, it happens in a very, uh, very surprising period that was this of the, pan uh, the pandemic. Uh, we can say that um, and the European Union being in the middle of uh, a crisis of its own regarding question of uh, solidarity and subsidiarity uh, uh, towards its member states and putting into question the raison d'etre of the European uh, uh, European project for its citizens, as uh, Paolo Conte, the Prime Minister of uh, Italy, would say at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, we. Uh, we had this uh, European uh, enlargement, but uh, which uh, I think uh, it is not, it, it's not radically different from the previous move uh, because, um, uh, because uh, uh, the pandemic and the response to it have more than uh, anything revealed uh, more than uh, any time the geopolitical challenges that the European uh, Union faces today. As, the, as a result, the, this uh, cri crisis promised to be less a turning point uh, than a way station along the road that the European Union and the uh, uh, and the uh, Western Balkan six, let's say, uh, uh, because now they they are six has been traveling for the last few decades. Uh, I just uh, shortly have a view of uh, this process uh, uh, from the point of uh, the past, uh, the present, and uh, the future. Uh, from the point of uh, the past, this enlargement uh, looks as a uh, business as usual because the decision was taken hastily and was uh, deliberately uh, strategic, such as it is mentioned in the uh, communique of the European Commission, but also uh, by the high uh, official of the European Union. Uh, the decision is considered as an important step in uh, re-engaging the region 
uh, more actively an important step in uh, in the more active uh, recovery of uh, of uh, the region but this uh, sounds an old cliche because only in uh, 2008 the european union um, uh, presented the strategy of uh, a credible enlargement perspective uh, for and enhanced eu enlargement with the western balkan as a response to what uh, um, uh, Mongherini in 2017 would consider it as uh, uh, the, considering that uh, we have to respond as such because uh, the Balkans uh, uh, can be a chessboard where the big powers game can be played. But we can go even further, uh, uh, remembering the uh, South uh, East, uh, the South European uh, uh, Stability Pact, where uh, it was again mentioned that the European Union is irretrievably committed in the Balkan and offer a clear perspective of the uh, EU uh, membership uh, to the Balkan uh, countries. At the time, they were more than six. And uh, in fact, uh, despite concern that the European Union has about uh, its just strategic interests in the Balkan, it, it failed to provide the functional common strategy for the, the uh, of the, uh, for the region. Instead, uh, all the time, uh, it offered a, re a, re a redefinition of the region uh, from uh, Southeast Europe, uh, Western Balkan, uh, uh, Balkans, uh, and whatever. And it reduced enough uh, procedur procedural changes that uh, since the Balkan has started uh, more vigorously to consider the, uh, the, the membership into the European Union, is uh, changing and uh, uh, previous participants uh, added that uh, uh, this hasn't added anything uh, that will create a new dynamic in the process uh, uh, of environment and some uh, some of these uh, kind of uh, of uh, procedural changes uh, uh, remained uh, rather doubtful how they will be put into a place as uh, as i uh, told before uh, considering the conditionality it, uh, it doesn't tackle this issue but it just uh, uh, consider that uh, if things doesn't go the right way uh, we can uh, uh, we can move, uh, move we can move back uh, in the process of uh, integration which was not the case uh, before in the view of the present, uh, the COVID crisis and its handling more than anything else, uh, I think uh, it highlighted and reinforced the basic feature of new uh, geopolitics in all levels at the international level, with uh, with uh, Western Balkan six uh, of no exception. Uh, we see that uh, during uh, the crisis, uh, China, Russia, and Turkey has uh, inserted themselves in the region in the face of the. A EU that in the beginning was uh, uh, facing a uh, hard uh, solidarity, uh, solidarity crisis, and uh, in fact, this reaction was uh, was marked by uh, the leaders of uh, the region, uh, with uh, Vucic uh, declaring that uh, European solidarity doesn't exist. That was uh, a fairy tale on on the paper, and uh, thank you to the people uh, People's Republic of China. To the rest, uh, to the rest, uh, thanks for nothing. Uh, to the Prime Minister of Albania, Dirama, he declared the Albanian plan C is, uh, is uh, uh, that uh, if the world is upside down, Turkey is committed to meet, uh, uh, thanks to God that Turkey exists, because it is, uh, it is uh, there to, uh, to meet the critical health needs of uh, the country, to continue with Djukanovic and all other leaders of uh, the region, thanking either uh, uh, Erdogan, Putin, or uh, or uh, China for uh, all this uh, uh, need they uh, provided. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, and it is time to uh, to remember and to be uh, positive, as um, as Ambassador Soreka said. Uh, but mainly because of uh, the close link uh, linkages developed with the Balkan country six until the recently, European Union has not far not so far evaluated the importance of the rights of what uh, Farid Zakaria calls the rights of the rest uh, as a danger to its own uh, geopolitical interest in the, in the Balkans. Uh, because uh, everybody knows that the record of European investment in the country is impressive. Uh, uh, European Union remained the first trading partner of all, European, of all uh, Western Balkan countries. 
uh, it is a leading do a donor to uh, projects and programs uh, for uh, human rights. Uh, the visa liberalization regime uh, for Western Balkan six uh, countries except uh, Kosovo uh, has fostered the exchange between uh, uh, social and cultural uh, exchanges between civil society, students, uh, journalists, uh, young politicians, trade leaders, teachers, and so on, uh, which now share, which they share ideas and projects with European partners. But also the EU Research Innovation Program has created opportunities for the Western Balkan countries, academia to be part of uh, research projects uh, uh, and uh, participate in excellent science. Uh, in excellent science uh, or uh, industrial leadership and tackling so, uh, so, uh, societal uh, uh, challenges. Uh, however, uh, the region remains among the poorest in Europe well, for many uh, for more than a deca decade. Uh, European Union proposed uh, a model that. Uh, uh, they seem to be now in competition with a challenger, uh, the civiliz civilizational challenger like uh, China, which uh, the ultimate purpose is to make Eurasia, including uh, the Balkan countries, an economic and trading uh, area to, uh, to rival the uh, Euro-Atlantic one. A spoiler power like Russia that is trying to derail by Balkan countries from the influence of Western institution by exploiting its favorable position with different communities in the region. A growing regional power like Turkey that is significantly stronger than its Balkan neighbors and is looking to translate this uh, uh, strength into influence. The challenges to the European projects in the Western uh, Balkans are even greater, at least in the short term, considering that Beijing, Moscow and Ankara tacit agreement to uh, sidestep any suggestion that undermine each other's initiative with uh, competing projects, which look that uh, in this kind of uh, endeavors they are in, a, uh, in a unison. In return, Balkan leaders see the current geopolitical challenges as an opportunity and not a problem. In turn, Balkan, uh, while economic factors are not significant for are uh, are not insignificant for most of the Western Balkan countries, uh, other competing initiatives offer more uh, offer novel pla uh, platforms for the rearticulation of uh, domestic and international uh, politics. Most of these uh, identity games uh, relate to distinct uh, politicization of the inter international role of the Western Balkan countries. And we can uh, sense the three group of uh, countries, the one that consider we are uh, European and would like to stick to, uh, uh, to uh, the rule of law and all the European uh, membership conditionalities. Uh, uh, and here we can see Macedonia, North Macedonia, Montenegro, Albania and Kosovo, or the ones which would like to play the independent and uh, try to use uh, the aid from other, pro uh, from other uh, rising powers uh, as a means to art articulate pro-Russian and Turkish stances. Uh, and the uh, most, uh, most explicit here could, uh, could be Serbia. And we have also some distinct uh, Southeast European uh, Europeans uh, which would like to use those, uh, those fundings uh, uh, coming from uh, other rising powers as a way to differentiate each other uh, from the others and make themselves more worth for, this, uh, for, uh, for uh, investments. Uh, the belief that, uh, that these political challenges uh, can be solved by uh, offering an ambiguous uh, uh, European enlargement perspective is, uh, I would think, uh, magical thinking, uh, because this experiment has run its course long ago, because uh, EU, uh, EU recent move is not a temporary rupture in um, otherwise stable equilibrium. A more fragmented region is coming into being that in some ways uh, more flexible and uh, open to opportunities, especially now that uh, auto autocratic promote uh, vigorous li alternative economic and civilizational models using all means at their disposal from, uh, from investments, soft power to coercion, all aiming to uh, stabilize their neighborhoods uh, and or challenge Western hegemony. In the view of the future, uh, 
I would say that you lure lar enlargement to which European uh, leaders uh, tether their hopes for preserving the existing balance of interest in the re region uh, is undermined by the fact that the politics nowadays are exposed to a severe anarchy of the global order. From a realist point of view, this is a period in which the uncertainty working of the multipolar uh, balancing process may bring important geopolitical shifts in the world leadership and distribution of the zones of influence. The situation lose, looks even more complex and brew with instability, considering the uh, reconfiguration of power is in the making and the redistribution of power may have uh, bearing upon state choices of alliances. In these uh, circumstances, EU is ambiguous about moving towards a deep mood, uh, mode of integration and slow, uh, a slow uh, in developing mechanism to anticipate and alleviate negative consequences of uh, geopolitical uh, developments. Although somebody would say that uh, after a very, uh, very gloomy beginning, uh, European Union uh, is uh, trying to cope with uh, the challenges by throwing a lot of money, first of all, by uh, throwing the enlargement process, but also by uh, uh, throwing a lot, of, uh, a lot of money for uh, rebuilding Europe and uh, for, uh, uh, for also helping uh, the Balkan, uh, uh, Western Balkan countries, as it is uh, mentioned. But uh, uh, even in this case, uh, as it was uh, anticipated before, uh, this is uh, also a, a very problematic uh, uh, question because uh, from where those money will come uh, out, uh, of course, Commission is proposing very revolutionary measures such as uh, uh, such as taxing GAFA or uh, trying to establish uh, to uh, establish import uh, uh, taxes for uh, countries outside the European uh, Union or uh, trying to um, uh, to uh, uh, provide uh, to provide the guarantees so for uh, uh, having uh, having credits uh, that are needed for uh, rebuilding uh, uh, re rebuilding Europe but um, everybody knows that uh, this has to be uh, to be discussed and approved by all member states uh, because uh, this kind of uh, developments require that uh, European uh, states uh, uh, pull, uh, pull together more elements of uh, uh, their um, sovereignty in the favor of, uh, uh, of, the European, uh, of the European Commission and there are uh, ones that somehow uh, some un uh, there are also somehow uh, um, uh, members that have uh, uh, problems with that. So I think uh, I, I'm going to uh, to end now because uh, other issues that uh, may be uh, may, may be are important to discuss so will come out with the question and give the opportunity to to further the discussion. We have we have some questions that we hope to, to be in time to, to, to tackle them. Uh, thank you, Professor Abazi. Yes, as you said, we have both, we have many problems, domestic problems within the Western Balkans, but also uh, other issues within the European Union. And I'm afraid that with the Europe fatigue, we, ha we are experiencing also a Balkan fatigue. Uh, I'm very curious to, to know what uh, Professor Zihid means by exploring subtle and efficient in efficient ways to say no to Europe. The floor is yours, Professor Deed. Thank you. So thank you so much, Claudiana. Uh, do you hear me? Perfect. It's so okay. thank you so much, and and uh, I'm happy to be uh, at least in this kind of a, a virtual uh, world uh, with you in Tirana. Uh, even though I have to ad admit that uh, I uh, just recently started uh, hating Zooms and, and go to meetings uh, as they uh, a little bit amputate uh, the senses that we have. So uh, next time I, I, I need to come to Tirana, join, uh, join Florian in Graz uh, and be able to just see you all uh, and to hug you all. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, thank you, thank you for put it, putting this up, uh, and let me just uh, try to make a few few points. Uh, 
so the, the title that I sent to you, uh, Claudiana, was Europeanization without democratization, uh, exploring subtle and efficient ways of uh, saying no to Europe. Uh, and I start with a kind of a puzzling moment that we have been observing for, for so long and that we need to address. So uh, my point is uh, we are facing in the Western Balkans, at least when it comes to some countries, and I have to say there are differences between six Western Balkans countries. Uh, but uh, in general, I would say we uh, are facing a process of Europeanization without democratization. Or even to put it to put it more more precisely, uh, and this is the paradoxical moment. If we have uh, Serbia and Montenegro uh, for a while being front runners in the European integration, and at the same time we have international reports telling us that the democracy, precisely in those two countries, is eroding at the same pace, like in Hungary or somewhere else, uh, then this is a moment that we have to address. Something is going wrong. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, this is this is my underlying uh, thesis, uh, and let me just develop the story a bit and make make a few points, but not elaborate too long. So basically, the the, the starting assumption in the process of Europeanization is that both the European Union, the politicians, and the citizens want to become part of the European Union, want the Europeanization uh, in a in a in a deeper uh, meaning of the, of the world. Uh, so the assumption is basically the political elites, they want it, uh, uh, Brussels and all states in, in Brussels, they want it, uh, we all want it, we like it, that's fine. Uh, and my point is, uh, we have, I mean, when we look at the opinion service, we have uh, uh, the majority of the populations in all six Western Balkan countries wanting the European Union, uh, but, and we have uh, and we, we have seen that kind of an effort also that European Union has has made during the COVID-19 pandemics after the first shock at the beginning. The EU has proven that uh, there is a commitment towards the Western Balkans and the investments uh, are really huge and the efforts are huge. And all the ambassadors, I mean, I have been or I am in touch with Ambassador Johan Sattler, who is a dear friend of Albania and uh, all ambassadors do a, a very, very good job. Uh, so this is this is fine. But I argue that the political elites uh, and the majority of the of the political setups in the uh, in the region they don't want uh, Europeanization that equals democratization. Why? Uh, because it's uh, I mean from my point of view it's quite simple. The power that they have that they exercise is built on pillars and 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 and, and blocks that are substantially not compatible with EU standards and with democracy as, as, it, as it is meant by the, by the European Union. Uh, and for them, basically, moving towards a full-fledged democratization will jeopardize the, uh, the, the pillars that they uh, embrace in order to keep the power uh, 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 stable on their side. Uh, and there are just few pieces, basically, that we all know. I mean, this is nothing new. And, and Florian and, and uh, Mr. Bouchard, as you, you all touched upon uh, uh, those those points. I mean, and, and I would just mention two or three before I come to my main main, main point. So basically, the uh, those SNS and then Djukanovic party and all those parties are power parties, basically, that are uh, uh, in a way. Uh, controlling institutions, uh, implementing a majoritarianism in, in, in the countries, ruling through law, uh, and then having a very subtle way of, of distributing uh, goods and resources through patronage and clientelistic uh, structures, both in politics and, and in, in, uh, in economy, that keeps uh, them uh, basically stable and functioning. And, and this kind of an understanding of democracy without plurality, without pluralism, uh, without freedom, with limiting spaces for for uh, looking for consensus, deliberation, and with limiting and captured state structures and institutions, is basically directly contradicting uh, the very point of of democratization or full fledged European democracy. So uh, this is obvious, uh, and, and and my point will be and and uh, that basically what we see in the Western Balkans right now, and I here borrow the term from John Keane's new book, uh, the new despotism, which is something that uh, uh, the book just came out, and I will uh, uh, suggest you to have a read uh, if you if you have uh, time. 
Uh, it's published in Harvard University Press, and he uses the term phantom, phantom democracies. And I would argue uh, that following up on this term of phantom democracies, uh, we also have to uh, uh, embrace a new term in the Western Balkans, which I will describe as phantom Europeanization. Uh, so uh, having said or de defined the, 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 the art of governing, the governmentality, the type of governmentality that I see, uh, let's look closer in what are those subtle and, and uh, I argue efficient ways to say no to Europe and to keep up this kind of a phantom uh, style uh, type of democracy and also a phantom Europeanization. First of all, I mean, and this that, that's quite important, uh, those regimes that are somewhere in the middle between full authoritarian systems and democracies, they all engage uh, in faking democracy through elections. So uh, faking democracy through elections or elections without democracy is the major pillar of their power. And we just need, I mean, that's, that's so simple, uh, uh, to keep this facade of the democratic life and this that type of pretending uh, uh, they need elections. Uh, and the best example is, I mean, uh, there is no far, no need for further uh, explanation. It's just elections on 21st of June uh, in Serbia, basically in the middle of, of possible second wave of COVID-19 and with one political party dominating uh, the whole political uh, and public space. Uh, uh, so this is my first point. Uh, the second point is uh, what all of those leaders, uh, I mean, in, in different variations, I, I, again, I don't want to argue that they are all the same. Zoran Zaev and, uh, is not the same type of leader uh, as Alexander Vucic. But uh, what they all have to a certain extent, some more and some less, is this very kind of a strong narrative of being indispensable. Uh, or to put it in, in the words of, of Margaret Thatcher, Tina, there is no alternative to what I represent. Uh, and mixed with some kind of pragmatism, towards the European Union, towards the international community, uh, this kind of uh, narrative of being indispensable creates, uh, uh, is another way to say basically no to Europe, but creates also a kind of an interesting and strong uh, power tool. Uh, the third point is, uh, and we just recently discussed it with Florian Biba in one of my seminars on, on authoritarianism, is basically uh, the, the virtue to rule uh, or to manage the anxieties and crises that they constantly perpetuate. I mean, we all remember tons of, of crises and anxieties that are uh, basically reproduced or uh, uh, used in the public, in the, in the political life in all of those countries. I mean, Milorad Dodik or Vucic sending the train to Mitrovica and then taking the train back or all, all those debates about the partition of Kosovo and then and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and between Kosovo and Serbia, uh, or I mean, we just need to look at, uh, at, at the headlines of, of the Boulevard uh, news uh, paper informer or something else in Serbia, where you basically, when you would count it, you would uh, uh, have an impression that there is a permanent war going on uh, and that uh, only one, only the savior can protect us from this kind of a chaos and instability. So basically ruling with this, constant picture of there is a chaos on the other side. If the opposition comes to the to the power, there will be chaos. Uh, if uh, we allow the uh, uh, talks to a bit to, to Kosovo, there will be chaos. If I, as Milorad Dodik, uh, start making consensual steps towards my my uh, uh, my almost friends in, in the Federation, uh, then uh, it will be chaos. So this is the third point that I see quite strongly as part of this phantom democracy phenomena. And the last one, and I believe this is a, a very, very kind of a, a soft uh, one, but I would say almost the most important one, and I call it uh, the uh, the mastery of seduction. Uh, seduction uh, in a way that you basically uh, uh, blur the boundaries between reality and fantasy, that you speak like Alexander Vucic has been doing for so long of golden age, that you, uh, that you support this kind of... Uh, of, of a moment where you basically amputate uh, the, the political senses and the criticism of the people uh, by creating all possible narratives that are placed somewhere between uh, reality and fantasy. Uh, and, and I mean, we, we can explore a, a bit more on that in the, in the Q&A, but there is just one wonderful picture for this type of 
being master of seduction towards the people, speaking about the right people, about us, uh, helping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is uh, this is probably the, this kind of uh, uh, futuristic, but but very strange and and frightening. Uh, 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 Alexander Vucic's uh, Zoom uh, 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 public rallies in front of uh, hundreds of of, of screens, uh, where he basically uh, uh, speaks to 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 people that are allowed just to to clap the hands as of when uh, and not to speak, uh, and 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 basically this is the perfect description for this kind of a seduction. So basically they are all amputated; they are just allowed to clap. I talk. I am the big one. Uh, and if there will be no mistakes, like I mean, in the last, in the second rally of this type, uh, 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 the guys from the Serbian Progressive Party made obviously a mistake. So there were people on the screens that were duplicated. So you would see the same faces on two screens, so which means basically this kind of uh, Zoom mobilization has has went wrong. Uh, so putting those pieces together. Uh, just again uh, supports uh, my assumption that this is a kind of a phantom in many of the countries and I would say definitely in Serbia uh, to a huge extent in, uh, in, in Montenegro uh, in a kind of a different extent but similarly in, in Bosnia uh, now with this whole theater uh, political theater in, uh, going on in Pristina with Taci, Grenell and all those guys uh, uh, creating basically uh, a mess against the against the will of the people in, in Pristina, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also, unfortunately, the uh, Eddie Ramas and the the city of Tirana's uh, 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 show in the night uh, by destructing the national parliament is, that fits a bit into this picture, even though Albania is in in a way a kind of a, of a, of, a, of a different case. So, what is the result of of this type of a phantom democracy or or Europeanization without democratization? Uh, the result is basically uh, the one that no methodology whatsoever on this earth uh, can change the fact uh, that we have uh, a kind of a spoiler moment uh, in, in the process. So basically, we have formal progress of the worst students in the class, front runner Serbia, Montenegro. We have lost the leverage uh, and the EU is also in a constant need to adjust to those policies, narratives, et cetera, et cetera. We, uh, that results also in inconsistencies in the application of conditionality. And that's also, uh, I would argue, uh, one part of the piece of this tablitocracy assumption that uh, BIEPAG and, and many other uh, uh, experts and groups have been discussing uh, for the last few years, uh, because the EU simply in a way needs to needs to buy in in those those phantom democratic uh, narratives and policies uh, so basically once again i don't think that any kind of new methodology can change it and i believe that there is a need for a kind of a substantial reshuffling uh, and what better moment for substantial reshuffling than the crisis i mean the, the the crisis if we if we take the european union the european union is or has been always made out of crisis and reactions to the crisis. And then uh, Mr. Bouchard spoke about, um, I mean, not being sure whether the, the Macron uh, and Merkel uh, plan is the new Hamiltonian moment uh, for the European Union. I'm not sure and either, but I could say that basically there is a there is a big moment in the European Union. The EU is not going to be the same. And I know Kurz, uh, my chancellor here in Austria, where I sit, is is trying to 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 form a group of states to uh, to have a kind of a old fashioned european union again but i believe there will be and there is some movement uh and and i i believe that uh, uh in this kind of a big reshuffling at the at the scale of the european union the balkans needs to be part and the europeanization or enlargement strategy whatever it is right now needs to be part of it uh, and that means and i mean obviously starting from set principles uh, and basic values straight uh, draw red lines uh, but then more fundamentally and this is what i really believe is, is very much needed allow alternatives uh, to pop up and 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 embrace by the european union actively those guys protesting uh, in front of the of the national theater in in tirana those guys uh, uh, going uh, on the balconies in Serbia at uh, 8.05 uh, 
uh, in the evenings as previously during the pandemics and, and protesting against against Vucic. Those people that showed, for example, after the earthquake in, 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 in Tirana and in Albania, that showed solidarity in the whole region. So there are, and my point is, there is a uh, there is a sense of solidarity. There are emancipatory forces, uh, and I would even say there are in some, some countries, and there are overall majorities. So there is a sense for the normalcy, uh, but it needs to be embraced. It needs to be stimulated. It needs to be, it, it needs to be uh, basically hugged. Uh, as I uh, said at the beginning, I would love to be in Tirana and to hug you. Uh, and uh, just, to, just to conclude uh, uh, with one last, uh, just a kind of a small picture uh, uh, here from Austria. Uh, and this is something that that uh, must not happen. Uh, just two days ago, the Austrian Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Schallenberg, uh, presented the the roadmap for opening up the borders uh, uh, for traveling within the European Union. And she, he showed a map, map of Europe, saying basically that from the 16th of June onwards, the borders between Italy, Slovenia, Croatia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, Austria will be opened. And then on this picture, on this map. There was a big white spot, uh, empty, totally empty. That was Western Balkans. Just a kind of, a, this time, not black spot, but white spot. No mentioning of the Western Balkans whatsoever. And at the same time, the Minister of Interior, Nehama, uh, gave a few days ago a kind of a press conference saying basically that we are supporting the Western Balkans, but we are focusing on close cooperation to keep borders closed and to manage illegal migration. Uh, and if we take this kind of a picture, how from, at least for, from the viewpoint of some member states, the Western Balkans is still being perceived uh, as a kind of a, a protective belt uh, uh, in terms of migrants, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and at the same time, not addressing this kind of a phantom democracy moment and phantom organization that we have, uh, then I, I'm really afraid then that, that uh, uh, we will simply miss the historical moment. Uh, we will simply miss the historical moment, and there is a huge, huge uh, danger that uh, this whole region will just fly back as a boomerang into the face of the of the continent, and we all don't uh, don't want to see that one. So thank you so much. Thank you, Vedran. Apparently, we have big problems with uh, leadership, political leadership, uh, here in the Western Balkans, don't we, Mr. Bushate? We have uh, tackled some issues of authoritarianism and uh, and this uh, Europeanization without an, a, a stabilized democracy, democratization, and uh, we we are yeah there is a, a huge debate even in the public sphere he, here down in the Western Balkans. Um, I I think that. I think that uh, we are in time of having just one, just one of the questions. I already had a look, a look in all of the questions that, uh, that our followers have posed. So I think we can we can um, group them in just one question. The first one that says. Based on the current situation in Europe, with their inter internal politics and COVID-19, can this lead Europe? I mean, Europe. I think that the, uh, that, the, the that Amanda means the European Union to a full political restructure, taking in in consideration problems and issues you already all of the panelists mentioned: populism, enlargement fatigue. After, especially after post-COVID, uh, the entrance of third powers in the in the Western Balkan. What what can we expect from the European Union, Mister? I I have to add something. What Mister Ambassador Ambassador uh, labeled as the the non-decision of the EU to open accession negotiation with Albania and Macedonia. In our in our region is is labeled or is called the refusal to open this the, these um, negotiations. Uh, so what 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 do you think? What will be the future of the of in European integration and enlargement 
process. I will. I think um, the, the, all our uh, of all our followers have not specified the, the which panel who who of the panelists is going to answer. So I'm I'm. I am deciding, being the moderator of this panel, I'd like to to listen to the idea of uh, to the ideas of Professor Bieber first, and then of uh, of uh, Mr. Bushate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think the my key observation was that I mean, first of all, in the European Union, populist parties have not done very well in recent months um, because of COVID-19, um, because um, they couldn't talk about the issues they like to talk about, which is migration or some kind of threat to European culture. Um, so this doesn't mean that they won't come back, but I think this they are currently not on the top of the agenda. But um, I think. On one side, of course, the European Union seems just dis, dis, um, disunited. But you know, we've seen. Uh, the, I think uh, Litme Bouchardi mentioned that the Fra Franco-German cooperation has increased. I mean, this is the first time that we've seen really uh, also Angela Merkel kind of uh, being uh, more proactive on trying to think about new ways European Union could work. Um, partly also pushed by the very negative decision of the German Constitutional Court. So I think we're seeing some kind of movement uh, in discussing the future of Europe um, and again I don't want to use Hamilton um, but I want to just talk about Europe um, in that sense but I think so so I don't see that Europe is the certain way exhausted itself I think it's but the, the problem is it's still not able to tackle the authoritarian drift within the European Union um, and with it um, the um, the, uh, the risks of authoritarianism in the Western Balkans. So I think this is this is more the challenge, where we have to see whether there's going to be an answer. But um, it's not yet it's not yet there. And I think we see you know um, the European People's Party unable to deal with the challenge of uh, of Viktor Orban uh, with Yanis Yansha. So I think this is the main the main challenge. It's less the populists. Uh, uh, in, in opposition, uh, whether it's Lega in Italy or AfD in Germany, they're not a big challenge at the moment, but it's really the challenge of how to deal with the authoritarianism in the European Union. And there, I don't yet see, uh, and this is maybe the, where, where everybody's expecting a signal from, from Germany, from the CDU, which is, of course, the most important member party of the European People's Party, to um, really um, uh, rid itself of the autocrats amongst their midst. I mean, not to say that they're not problematic members in other European party families, but it's really here where we would like to, you know, everybody's expecting some clear measure, especially, and again, COVID highlighted the authoritarian reflex across the region and the emergency law in Hungary and the lifting of the emergency law in Hungary, which is not a lifting, but just a transformation, um, is in fact showing that some countries, and, and Hungary has been by multiple international actors, observers called as not a democracy. BDEM or Freedom House both have said Hungary is no longer a democracy. Uh, so the EU is a union of countries in Europe, which is not exclusively a club of democracies anymore. And we have to be very clear about that. And there hasn't been that clarity from um, key EU member states and key political parties. This is, I think, the biggest challenge. Mr. Bouchate? I would agree more or less with uh, uh, what Florian uh, was mentioning in relation to the uh, challenge to the challenge ahead of uh, uh, ahead of us. Uh, I no matter whether uh, we speak about uh, Europeanization without uh, democratization, which uh, uh, I, I like a lot, uh, we are all confronted uh, with a situation where we have to bridge the gap between um, what is on paper um, and what is the reality. Um, and so far we have seen um, European Commission being on a survival mood uh, when it comes to the um, enlargement process. But uh, on the other hand, uh, European Com European Commission has not been successful enough to penetrate to different layers of society 
when we speak about the uh, reform process, when we speak about uh, transformation process, when we speak about uh, uh, democratization process. So uh, right now uh, in the Western Balkans, uh, more or less, uh, we have a network of electoral democracies. So the hardware is there, uh, but uh, we are far from being uh, uh, an inclusive democracy where you have the software also being installed to, to the to the hardware or uh, or having those two mechanisms working 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 together. Uh, and in this in in this respect, I believe. Uh, uh, the position of uh, Macron, although it created lots of uh, frustration in the Balkans, including including Albania, uh, uh, triggered somehow uh, the 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 the, uh, the dynamics uh, uh, within uh, within this uh, bureaucracy on how to uh, on how to treat the the, the enlargement process and also countries uh, countries in the region. Uh, but uh, right now. Uh, we have to we have to respond to legitimate questions. How it is possible that countries that are in the negotiating uh, process, such as Montenegro and Serbia, which are considered to be um, uh, as front runners, uh, do have a democratic deficit, uh, not only in reality but a democratic deficit that is being confirmed or evidenced by all credible international institutions and organizations um, which are analyzing which are analyzing our region so uh, in this respect uh, uh, we need to think in a more strategic way how uh, to uh, make a direct linkage between rule of law related reforms and economic development because there is no sustained economic development without rule of law and there is no rule of law without sustained economic development and we should learn also from our own failures uh, for all uh, albanian polos that are part of this uh, virtual virtual uh, conference and discussion we all know uh, justice and home affairs once then rule of law then fundamental first they have always been there as part of priority of uh, EU financial assistance. We have started with the first EU assistance mission on rule of law and justice reforms back in 2005. And this was due to taxpayer, EU, EU taxpayers' money. And only in 2014 and 15, we realized that we need uh, a brand new reform uh, about uh, justice architecture and the justice system. And now um, we are we are facing with a bit of reality. On one hand, the vetting process has gone deeper and deeper, but we are facing also the consequences of not having a constitutional court um, and high court and 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 justice institutions being paralyzed. So uh, I, I I believe we need to strike a balance between these two uh, critical components of democratization. So a rule of law on one hand, um, and uh, also uh, economic development on the other hand. The last point I, I want to make, since Florian was mentioning CDU, it's very interesting to know. If you read uh, the, the, the motion of uh, German Bundestag on Albania, on North Macedonia, and also on Serbia a few years ago, in some cases the analysis is more molecular than the one provided by the European Commission. So uh, it's very difficult for the citizens to, to, to explain the dynamic between a strong or a key EU member state such as Germany and the European Commission. Uh, but this ping pong between the European Commission on one hand and key EU member states on the other hand also uh, need to be addressed uh, in the future. And I hope the new methodology uh, and the uh, enlargement commissioner who is on the driving seat and coming from uh, from 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 hungary is consciousness about uh, about uh, the responsibility that lay, lies ahead of him 
Thank you. Two more brief remarks from Vedran and Anika, and I'd like to conclude. I know there are a lot of things to say. I hope to be to be able to bring you in Albania as soon as possible and uh, to discuss further on these questions. So Vedran, how do you see this enlar enlargement policies or uh, the, the, the European integration process of the Western Balkan? How is it going to, to be shaped? I mean, uh, first of all, and, and I believe that's that's quite obvious. I mean, uh, the EU has has always tried to adjust somehow, somehow to address. And I believe the bureaucrats in in, in Brussels they really believe that enlargement can change something. Uh, and and uh, but the point is, and and what we need to address is really the the, the internal setup of our countries uh, in, internally in order. Uh, uh, to, to present ourselves and, and to be in, in a way able to, to co-shape uh, what, what Brussels is doing. Uh, and and uh, going back to my, to my argument about phantom democracies and, and, and basically narrowing it down to the people, to the people. So uh, I would say that uh, that's this kind of a phantom democratic uh, uh, approach of, of the majority of the regimes that we have, uh, they are basically perfect uh, in, in, in uh, nurturing on this voluntary servitude uh, of the people and voluntary servitude uh, i mean in the in it, it's a kind of a moment where people uh, are just expecting from um, or the majority of the population let's say in serbia or those that are members of the serbia progressive party or people close the dodic or um, members of the of the jukanovic party uh, they are just used to live in this kind of a setup where they have certain privileges, they accept uh, to be the slaves, they even love the masters, etc., uh, etc., et and that's one part of those societies. Uh, but uh, voluntary servitude you choose, and as you choose this voluntary servitude, there is a way also to let it go. Uh, and, and that's the, my major point. We need to change the dynamics in a way internally. So if we pick up, if we try to, to, to nurture uh, and to embrace basically all those other energies of people critical of the masters, people ready to stand up, people uh, ready to show solidarity, we would have a kind of an incredibly strong regional wave of, of, of true solidarity against the voluntary servitude and we might change the common sense. The common sense now is the one of seduction and 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 uh, people are sedated in a way amputated uh, but i believe that can be reawakened and when this is reawakened and when we then in the next step have a kind of a european union that uh, feels uh, that there is a kind of a different different pro european pro democratic sentiment and starts supporting those forces we can suddenly even though we don't expect it, and we believe. I mean, the, the common people in, in in Belgrade today believe that Vucic is going to be there for the next ten or fifteen years. Uh, uh, but I believe we can have a sudden change in the Western Balkans and possibly a sudden wave of democratization or popping up emancipatory forces, where then the European Union can come in and basically uh, create a kind of a, of a common mutual uh, mutual process that leads towards a full democratization. But in order to have that, and I'm just completely on Florian's side in terms of we need, uh, the European Union needs to address internal problems. And if there is no answer to Hungary, if there is no answer to Poland, uh, there will be basically no way to have an answer uh, to the Western Balkans. So for the time meaning, we need to reverse the process and look uh, bottom up to the people and try to replace this voluntary servitude. Professor Abbas, a brief remark to conclude, please. Could you open the microphone? Yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, I think that I would like to start uh, from a short answer to what Amanda asked about the uh, the possibility of uh, European Union to restrict itself under this uh, this uh, challenge that the uh, uh, coronavirus um, crisis has presented to the Union. In fact, uh, it is not the, the crisis of the epidemics that has uh, put uh, the question of restructuring the European Union uh, into the fore, because uh, such an issue has been presented by Macron uh, since uh, when he was elect elected, and uh, he uh, made it clear 
that uh, uh, without deepening the integration within the European Union, it will be uh, difficult to go on with the enlargement. And this uh, enlargement response that we saw, it was in fact uh, an answer to the geopolitical challenges that the European Union is facing. And in fact, the uh, European Union is in front of uh, a big challenge uh, related to its, uh, its uh, even existence because it's suffering not only from uh, uh, the reign authority of uh, authoritarianism in two countries such as Hungary and Poland, or uh, problems uh, with uh, the Liga Nord uh, in um, in Italy, but this also challenges it, it in its uh, uh, normative uh, uh, framework because already we have the uh, German court that has challenged the uh, um, the legitimacy of uh, uh, of the so-called uh, acquis communautaire regarding the policies of the European Central Banks, which leads to another problem that has to do with the, with the uh, financial and uh, uh, fiscal common policies of, uh, of uh, the European Union, and not to go to other social and immigrant crises that the European Union has to, uh, to dial, and populism that has been uh, so much uh, involved in the discussion before, uh, before the pandemic. So uh, uh, without resolving this kind of issue that the European Union is facing, uh, we like it or, or we don't like it, uh, Macron is, is right because in such kind of situation that the union is, it will be uh, very difficult to have a vigorous uh, enlargement uh, policy. And that's, uh, uh, that's why I was trying to say that uh, from all perspectives, from past, present and the future, uh, it looks that uh, the uh, re response is uh, just uh, uh, as a, uh, something, a reaction to geopolitics of, uh, of uh, the moment. And uh, uh, to resolve this, the European Union has to become a very important uh, player in the international stage. And uh, in this framework, Western Balkans, uh, it uh, it's, shouldn't be considered as its backyard, but uh, as an integral part of it, because uh, it's there where the geopolitical gains of uh, uh, rising powers, uh, other than the European Union, in also facing the, the retreat uh, of uh, United States engagement in Europe, and that's how elsewhere in, in the world, the European Union don't have the choice if it would like to exist and to, to respond to those uh, challenges. So um, uh, uh, the enlargement and what will be exactly about it will depend in fact uh, on this uh, on what will be going uh, with the structure of the European Union and mm -hmm. uh, Mark, I wanted to say it's about um, uh, the idea that uh, we should more emphasize uh, some uh, somehow the uh, European approaches toward the Western Balkans because uh, um, in the discussion, there, there are a kind of uh, there, there is some kind of representation that uh, when we talk about the Balkans, uh, it's somehow uh, we know they are authoritarian, uh, and if it is not which it should be another that will be more authoritarian uh, as him. Uh, it is Rama, but the one will will come, nothing will change. Uh, and we will we, we do not uh, bring an attention to what uh, European Union should. Uh, be thinking uh, in its uh, policies towards uh, uh, the region. And it is not just changing procedures, because procedures are procedures. They do not take into consideration social processes that take, that take place in, uh, in, the, in the Western Balkan because of uh, policies of the European Union. And I try to mention some of uh, uh, the effects and the problems with uh, uh, conditionality. But uh, what I consider important to write the issues because dealing in details uh, is not uh, possible in a, such a limited uh, a time. Yeah. But we enjoyed all the issues that uh, were brought about. I thought uh, I think so, that something at the end uh, will move on on the right direction. Yes, uh, Professor Abazi, thank you. This socialization issue of the European norms is a very interesting field of studies, uh, also that is taking a part, that is, uh, that is uh, era, era, era arising now. Um, I'm very sorry to have to, to finish, to end this, uh, this interesting panel. Uh, we will talk more on European geopolitics in the next panel. Uh, I have to. Uh, I, one one thing I have to re, to, to remind you is that if you want to further uh, elaborate your ideas within a paper or in an article, 
we we could publish them in a in a in a very special issue of our of our journal uh, Politica, the journal of our department. So we will send you an email afterwards. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Vedran, uh, Professor Bieber, Professor Enika, uh, Mr. Bushati, and uh, thank you to, to thanks to Mr. Ambassador who was, was who was with us this morning, and to the Vice Rector of the University of Tirana, uh, Mrs. Kera, who was so nice uh, to, to to welcome this panel. Uh, I hope to see everybody soon. I, we promise. Uh, I, don't we, Mr. Bushadi, that we will soon bring, be able to bring you in Albania as soon as the global conditions will allow it. And I really thank you, uh, thank you to SIDEF for um, making this possible and see you in, at the next um, opportunities and at the, at the next um, panel. Thank you. Bye.